introduce myself. I, I just, I'm Jason Leggett. I, I teach here in the political science program. Uh, in political science, we investigate or we examine or analyze or all these terms you hear in your classes. Right? The structures and institutions, the instruments of power, and the decision making processes. So I want to just distinguish that because the science of politics is different than two people yelling at each other on a TV screen. Okay? Some people think that's politics, and that's fine, but that's not what I study, and that's not my fellow political scientist, which is at least one of them. Any other political scientists? Maybe a political philosopher. <laughs> um, so I, I was asked to think about two questions, and I, I, we thought about this in my environmental politics class. Please take it from the fall. Um, and so I'll encourage my students to help answer some questions that we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but I just want to give you just like a basic overview, which I would call like environmental politics 101 uh, in a very small nutshell. Uh, I think the first question I was asked is how did we get here? So this, there's three answers, and, and this is well known within political science. Um, in America, I don't think this is shocking to you, but we have a job first ideology. Right? So any issue that comes up, it's always about jobs first. So you saw the gentleman here that represents the, uh, the plastics industry. He said, I employ X number of people, and right, so that's, that's the end. So oftentimes in the political environment, if you don't have this at the forefront of your brain, if you're not saying, well, I'm gonna replace those jobs with something else, it's gonna fall on deaf ears. Okay, so that's just number one. Number two is something I, I, I think is interesting because I'm just going to call it corruption because in other countries we call it corruption. In America we call it campaigning. Yeah. Okay? And again, this is something that political scientists we've known since the 80s. Um, in my research preparation just to see how far back I could take this, it was 1946 and during the Truman administration there was, you know, we hear this all the time now, but there was unprecedented lobbying. And that was a direct response to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We happen to know what he did during his presidency to reach the people. The radio. And corporations and organizations, labor unions, farmers, everybody got really jealous of this power. But they also learned from this power. They said, why do I need to bother talking to Congress people if I can just talk directly to the people? Okay? So this corruption is known as the Iron Triangle and the difficulty of accountability of lobbyists, which I'll show you a picture, which I think does a better job. But then there's this other problem. And I, I'm, I'll briefly describe this real quick, just to show you that it's possible. So after the World Trade Center attack and the Pentagon attack in 2001, within three years, an entire regulatory body was invented called the Department of Homeland Security. There's also TV shows, and I checked last night, Homeland. Anybody see this show? What other shows are out there that deal with terrorism, defense, any other people? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? And then so much so that like years and years later, I start hearing students referring to the World Trade Center attack and the Pentagon attack as 9-11, which when I was growing up was the thing you pushed on the phone to call the police to come to your house if you were having a problem. So the ideology like, got completely seeped into American culture within a very short amount of time to deal with the problem that was determined as terrorism. So it's not impossible for the government to respond. So we want to start to think about, okay, so then how did we get here with this particular issue? Well it gets really super complicated because there's a lack of regulatory or enforcement bodies that cover all three areas, the land, the air, and the sea. So the Department of Agriculture obviously has nothing to do with the sea or the air. The FDA right, looks at very particular products but then doesn't look at the things feeding into those products. And we can go through all the regulatory uh, bodies and, and I might actually just pull that up because I think some of you have never seen it before. And this is our United States government at the federal level, right? And so there's a lack of 
oversight because there are frankly just so many different bodies within the government, which is largely why they formed the Department of Homeland Security, to join a bunch of bodies into one unit. So it's not impossible, but it's politically extremely difficult. Okay, very visually, you will memorize that. Okay, right, but you see that there's just a ton. Okay. So then I want to just pull us into this triangle, and I wish I could make this, you know, a little bit bigger, but I think you can kind of get the idea. And then I have to add this other concept called the revolving door. Just show of hands. Has anybody ever heard of the iron triangle or the revolving door? Political scientists try so hard to like come up with catchy titles and then nobody does it, right? So it's fun. So the iron triangle is like pretty simple. So you have politicians, right? We elect them, right? Vote, right, right, right. And then, you know, we have lobbyists. Who do lobbyists work for? Trade unions, corporations. You know, your favorite nonprofit organization. And what's, what do they say that they are trying to do? Advocate. Right, advocate to Legislate. the legislators to get them to pass laws to benefit their people. Seems pretty innocent, right? Okay, and then you have the agencies that are supposed to regulate these corporations, these workplaces, etc., etc. Everything seems okay, right? Anybody see a problem here? What's the problem? Uh, people who are from the you know, lobbying groups can be uh, put onto these boards in control of the lobbying groups. And so now you see why we call it the revolving door. So, just to, I mean, this is like an old joke from my family who's from Appalachia about being your own grandmother. So, that like, you can be a congressperson or a president. And then you can work in an agency, or vice versa. And then you can be a lobbyist and talk to your old friends back in the agencies and the government. It's so It's a conflict of interest. Right, and legally we would call it a conflict of interest. And then when other countries do it, we call it corruption. And we call them developing countries, and we call them not democratic. But in America, again, what do we call it? Lobbying. Campaign, right? Like a campaign. What's the big deal? So the big deal is this. In one, in one paper from 2005, specifically about the petrochemical companies, the ones that make plastic, they have found this so lucrative. They make so much money selling their plastic materials, oil and gas reserves, to the United States government. Everybody understand what I just said? What did I just say? Somebody help me. Not for my class. What did I just say? Who are they selling their products to? They unite the Congress, right? And not directly, like they're not going to their house and filling up their car with gas, although maybe it might happen, right? I don't know. Right? But, but selling it to the government, they've spent six times the amount of money for those purchases by the government and their lobbying efforts than selling to you and I. I'm going to say that again so it sinks in. They've spent six times the amount of money in their campaign donations so that they can sell their products to the government than they spent donating to the same government to sell products to you and I. So it was supposed to be in the public interest. What happened? It became the private interest of a handful of people. So it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, what is this all about? Money. Capitalism, right? And they get better and better and better at getting things for themselves. So from the last session, how many of you were here in the last session, last time? The big kind of question is like, you know, are the corporations, right, is Pepsi Cola, is Nestle, are they really going to tell us whether plastic bottles are healthy for us? Why not? Because of the 18,000 employees. And then the CEO as well. How do they but go back to number one, right? Why are we here? What, what, what got us here? The jobs first ideology. So they know it works. Even though none of us are working in these fields, right? I don't think anybody working in the plastics industry. Right, none of us. 
right? They're going to keep using this language because it works, even though they probably don't care about the workbench, right? Because they're switching over to automation and robots and whatnot, so they, right, okay? But what's the second thing? What's the second reason that they don't want to tell us? We'll stop buying. We'll stop buying. Right, we'll stop buying. And political science students, how do we know that? What other two things did we study where that happened? Cigarettes. Cigarettes. The more negative attention the media paid on cigarettes, plummeting sales. What was the second thing? This one's hard to remember because it was before I think most of our time. But some of you might remember. DDT. Pesticides. Same thing, right? It's spiking up as long as all the stories are happy, right? Like plastic saves babies. Right? I saw that commercial. That's a real commercial. Plastic saves babies. Right? Of course, it kills. <laughs> but the plastics, right, are paying advertising firms to have good stories about them. Everybody's understanding so far? But there's a third problem here, or there's a third reason why they're not going to tell us you know, the truth, if, that, if that's important. So there's a danger in their product. Right? But so why? I don't to tell you. They lose the whole thing. But here's what I'm trying to get at. This is the law side of the politics, right? If I told you suddenly that those plastic bottles are causing all these terrible diseases, <coughs> and the plastic bags that are everywhere are causing all these terrible diseases, what, what are you likely to do? You're going to sue them. You're going to sue them. So there you go. Right? I mean, in criminal law, we have the Fifth Amendment, right? I'm not going to incriminate myself. They're not going to come out and say, please sue us. So you have these three kind of tendencies working against us. And I think that's the easiest way I can explain how, how we got it. This is how we got it. Okay. Are there any questions about how we got it? Question. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Hi. my customer has raised it. Okay, the, you know, monog like monopolies and oligarchies, like, don't they like, still affect that iron triangle? Like, in that they don't want to tell us, but like, you know, the product is so prevalent and so used that, you know, it's hard to like boycott them. You know what I mean? Like the sign is owned by Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola in a lot of places is still used. So I think the reason why cigarettes were easy to like, you know, to boycott is because they have a stigma from a society. You know, they're not that really like a thing that we need. And it's prevalent. I mean tell that to smokers, right? Yeah, tell that to smokers, no. Okay, so, so what was once you know, seen as a social value or something that was important to do, largely they used the campaigning of soldiers who were fighting you know, in World War II, so you know, there's some prestige there. But on the other hand, like, again, I asked, like, well, why is plastic cool? Why, why is that a sign of wealth or prestige? Or, like, why is that needed? I, mean, I totally agree with you, but, but there seems to be a problem here with the way we're processing these. I think it comes to like a style issue. Some people want an individual model. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's just the in crowd. Keep talking. They're selling the safety factor that you can't break a glass bottle. Right. How many of you have broken a glass bottle? Right, I'm not the only one. Good. Okay. Right. So there's this idea that I can use it forever. Of course, I don't use it forever. I Throw it out. And so I think probably at one time, right, if we were sitting in the science lab in 1958, we'd be like, let's make an unbreakable plastic bottle. Yeah, sure. But now, you know, fast forward 2019, why don't I want to make an unbreakable plastic bottle and sell it, you know, sell my Sprite in it? I can't make any money. I need you to throw it away so you can come back and buy some more Sprite. Because you're not buying the Sprite, you're buying the plastic bottle. You're paying $9 a gallon for plastic, right? Water bottle, do you have? 
Okay? And then when you go into Manhattan, is there fewer or more options? More. I went to a bodega near 34th Street in the Graduate Center uh, two days ago, and I kid you not, there was like 30 different options of water. <laughs> All different prices. <laughs> and I watched people grab, right, and they're not even looking at the price because they're brand new, right? right? They want their brand. So it's, it's this convenience factor plus, right? And then I'll just highlight this even further. The glass bottles of water. Anybody know those bottles? Perrier, yeah. Evian. Right, <laughs> what, what are these supposed to be? Right, fans. You want me some fans? They're carbonated. Right? What do you guys say, soda or pop? I forget. Soda. 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 Soda pop. Soda pop. Right. <laughs> Nobody? Yeah, I know people say soda pop. Alright, so right, this beverage, right, that's carbonated. So I think when people were saying, like, well, my water comes from a spring. Or some magical place, right, in the far off island, right, the Fiji, so, okay, right? But in reality, it's coming from the same place that the carbonated water from all these other places are coming from, right? Which again is the tap to the machine that carbonates the water, and then we put a label on it, we brand it. So it's like this system that we're kind of stuck in. Everybody's kind of clear so far? So you're, you're right in calling this a policy monopoly, and my old professors at the University of Washington said the same thing. These are policy monopolies. You said monopoly in the corporate sense, but then now they're policy monopolies. So guess who gets to write the laws and regulations about the plastic industry? The plastic industry. Why, why is that a conflict of interest? Anybody? They're going to cheat. And what's their bottom line? By law, by the way, what are they required to do? Make a profit. These aren't public interest organizations. These are corporations. They have to make money to give dividends to their investors and their shareholders. So we obviously have a clearly you know, messed up system, a broken system. And the only thing I'm really surprised at, because I've been studying this for a fairly long time, is in 2000, the year, right? There were calls by senators from both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and the like, three independents that existed at the time <laughs> to have campaign finance reform. So you would have expected that the donations from the lobbyists since then would have gone down. But what do you think has happened? Exponentially. What's that word mean? Multiplied, 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 multiplied. And then again, just to show you.